focus more on aspects of business that are particularly important to me and where I and our company maybe have been countercultural, doing things differently than some others in business. So I'll give you a few lines about our company, Mind Safety Appliances Company, or MSA, the safety company. The organization was founded about 99 years ago in Pittsburgh by two mine rescue engineers who wanted to do something to stop the terrible carnage in the American coal mines at the time. So they persuaded Thomas Edison to invent an electric cap lamp battery, which along with the complete lamp, removed open flame lamps from a flammable methane and coal dust laden mining atmosphere, which had been the cause of most mining explosions and death. This started the great movement of safety in mining, so that today there are so few fatal accidents underground in the US, although one is one too many, that statistically traffic and material handling accidents on the surface of underground coal mining properties prevent, present greater statistical danger to human life than working underground. In the old days, the way miners learned of or checked for adequacy of oxygen and absence of toxic gas was by the use of a canary, which in theory would be negatively affected by hostile gases and would pass out before the person did. So if the canary flopped off, then you bring it out. MSA invented instrumentation to give much more reliable detection of gas. And a classic MSA ad shows the bird with the caption, unemployed since 1920. <laughs> and also, we put the canary back in the parlor where, where he and she belongs. Uh, early on, the company saw the need for safety in American industry was every bit as much as the need underground <laughs> products for the industrial worker. So today, only a tiny percentage of our business is in mining safety, and our biggest customer groups are the fire service and oil and gas. We're in over 40 countries worldwide, sales over a billion dollars. One of our claims to fame is that in that famous picture of President Bush at ground zero, the veteran firefighter behind him had our helmet and our respirator, and most of the people in the audience had our hard hats. That image and one of our gas masks were on the cover of Time Magazine, two out of three consecutive editions. We got where we are by the decision by my father in the 1940s with the support of the surviving founder to focus on safety products and move onward to the world. Now a majority of our sales are outside of North America. The major move overseas was my father's decision in 1958 to purchase the German safety equipment Corporation Al Gesellschaft, which had been a typical case of a forlorn, forgotten subsidiary of a large, diversified industrial giant. It was located in West Berlin, then under serious threat from the Soviets. Presently, MSA operates directly in locations as diverse as Brazil, Dubai, India, China, South Africa, and Kazakhstan. Our key product areas are self-contained breathing apparatus that provides vital air to firefighters and others in the respirable atmospheres. Instruments, large and small, to detect dangerous gases in the absence of oxygen. V-Guard had hard hats, the classic V-shape that I'm sure you've seen because we have the, we're the top seller in the United States and in the world, hard hats. Fall protection and many other products to save human life and health. Our mission is that men and women may work in safety and communities may live in health throughout the world. This has been our mission essentially for almost a century and it is what drives us. Once an article in the Conference Board magazine gave the following criteria for visionary companies. Premier institution in its industry. Widely admired by knowledgeable business people. Makes an indelible imprint on the world in which we live had multiple generations of chief executives, has been through multiple product and service life cycles, and founded before 1950. We're not well enough known to meet the second criteria, but I think we meet all the others. 
So if you'd like to know more about us, you can log on to msasafety.com or pick up the material that I left. And, and the history of MSA that I left is only 11 pages, so it won't be a real long read. Um, in my 16 years as CEO, I saw and dealt with many changes in the world and business, some wonderful and some distressing. During this time, in my previous, and in my previous position in, as head of our international division, vice president, and afterwards, I have been to many places, and God willing, in another month, I will achieve a lifetime goal of visiting 100 countries, including Malta. <laughs> I've got that one in. I was a history major, and I saw history made. I experienced Berlin before the wall, during the wall, stood on top of it, saw it breached, and saw it gone, and then observed a broad new capital being built on its former space including last week or two weeks ago. And I recommend Berlin when you go to Europe. It's a fascinating history. Perhaps the most touching moment of that era was driving past the Lithuanian church in South Chicago just after the end of the Soviet Union and seeing on the sign of the Bolton Lord of the church. Thank you, Blessed Mother, for answering 50 years of our prayers and giving our country its freedom. And I had a wonderful visit to Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia a couple of years ago. I survived in this job four times longer than the average US CEO tenure. We at the company experienced both sides of Joseph Schumpeter's famous principle that economic growth is the process of creative destruction. The destruction side in some key markets came from close to ending my career and our team's handling of the creative side eventually gave us a five to eight year run where our stock price tripled the S&P 500. A very nice performance, even though it wasn't my primary objective. We're a public company, but have significant inside shareholders so that we can execute a long-term strategy and be around to reap the benefits of our initiatives. And equally or more importantly, to do business the right way. I retired as long planned at age 65 as had my predecessors. It made sense and gave me a chance to do many other things I long wanted to do, including reading all these books. My successor is a long time MSA research engineer, product manager, and executive. I get along very well with him, contrary to the usual stereotype. And I know that I'm a non executive chairman of the board. Midway through my career, I was distressed by the change in the American business culture from what I knew before, where leaders told us to ignore all values except the short-term bottom line and the stock price. Their ways of business leadership and their ethics were so different than what I learned from my father and from my other mentors in business. On these attitudes, I did a, a spin on Barry Goldwater, who received my first presidential vote, to say extremism in the pursuit of virtue can become a vice. We do need to watch the bottom line, but we need to watch other things as well. Matters got so bad in that era in the late 90s that 20% of the highest paid corporate executives in 1999, as listed in Business Week, ended up being in jail the ones that didn't qualify for the slammer bothered me as well. Their names said it all. Chainsaw Al Dublap, Rambo and Pinstripes, Neutron Jack Welch, Fred the Shred. This was the era where Pepsi and GE invented the nefarious concept that you should fire every year 10% of your people. Those perceived as the lowest performers. A less Colorfully named for the famous executive was Larry Vossity of GE Allied Signal in Honeywell. In an article in Fortune magazine, he was asked by a manager in one of his plans, quote, with all of the demands placed on us for keeping up with the business requirements of high performance, we can't find even a minimal amount of time to spend at home to carry out our family responsibilities. What can be done? Bossy's answer was, that's a good question. 
Unfortunately, I don't have a good answer for it. Next question. A year later at a conference, with the help of um, my distinguished <coughs> assistant who, who pulled the, the quote out of the file, I quoted that article, Section Debosity, at, at a conference and asked him if he had been misquoted or ha had he had any second thoughts. And he danced around the matter with essentially no change. Conversely, once at MSA, my chief operating officer, Tom, and I discussed an executive whom we will call Jack, who was known to be at the office almost every Saturday and Sunday. Jack has had and has a wife and four sons. After we talked, Tom told Jack that the company didn't expect these kind of hours. They weren't good for him or his family. And Tom asked Jack, how could the two of them figure out how Jack could better manage his work in his department? In the end, it wasn't Jack's workload that was the problem, but it was his need to delegate better, use his staff better, and not agonize so long on decisions. This is the way we treat our people. Time doesn't permit me to express my frustration with exec excessive executive compensation, which as I unfortunately but correctly predicted in the 1990s, would resuscitate the left wing of American politics. So from now on, I'll, I'll draw on my remarks of the speech I gave at my retirement five years ago, which was held in the same location with many of the same people as was my inaugural address when I became CEO in October 1991. These are my reflections on business. My apologita, apologia for poor vita sua. And when I say we and now, henceforth in this text, it means those who gathered in 2008 from my address. My 1991 inaugural speech started with a quote from Thomas Jefferson and ended with one from John Kennedy. What really pleased me about that text was that with some slight modifications, my successor and I could give it again on my retirement day. And today, for that matter, and it would work. In 2008, I started my remarks with these words by Abraham Lincoln. I am not bound to win, but I am bound to be true. I am not bound to succeed, but I am bound to live up to the light that I have. Whether we had victory or success over these years is up for others to decide. But on those two objectives, being true and living up to one's inspiration, those I believe I did reach. Further, in the words of Sir Isaac Newton, if I see far, it is because I am standing on the shoulders of giants. For me, this was my father and his COO, Jean Mary, who led this company for decades, and the legacy of my grandfather and Mr. Dyke, the company founders. They taught us the essentials of this business, our mission, that men and women may work in safety and they, their families and their health, and in, in their communities may live in health throughout the world. Have a global outlook. Get into international areas early. No place on earth is foreign, a term I forbade it to say, except for its use in technical terms like foreign exchange, because wherever people need protection, that's our neighborhood. At MSA, we're all in this together. Shareholders, management, and associates. Quality is essential because our products are used where life is on the line. Financial prudence and a conservative balance sheet greatly assist the longevity of an organization. The more solid your balance sheet is, the more gutsy the strategic moves you can make. During the tough times we had in the 1990s, in spite of so much Diversity. What we had going for us at MSA were five things. Our mission, our people and their know-how, the reputation of our products, the friendly ownership of stock by my family, and the fire service, our largest market. And that, my friends, turned out to be enough. At one very tough spot on February 29th, year 2000, I used the words of scripture, Paul to the Galatians, chapter 6, verses 9. Let us not become weary in doing good. 
for at the proper time we will reap the harvest if we do not give up. And after that, we went on to six great years and two more with solid accomplishments. It was an adventuresome ride, and the company thereafter and now has good prospects for the future. Over the years, we learned that changes are needed to have successful performance, and sometimes to survive in a competitive economy. I have often used the following comments in my speeches. Companies are organic living entities that live in a fast-changing world and try their best to adapt to it. Successful companies are those that really stand for principles and products that create something meaningful in what at times can seem to be a chaotic world. A company, even after having been successful for many years, needs to adapt to this changing environment or else it will lose its shirt. However, a company must also stay faithful to its basic principles that made it great or else it will lose its soul, and then eventually it should as well. I always try to manage change, sometimes significant change, in a company from this perspective. One of my heroes in life was Blessed Pope John XXIII, who with, among many others, I once stood in the same room. His attitude towards changing things was excellently grounded. Focus on the mission and figure out what is the most effective way to accomplish that mission. He stayed deeply committed to the church's mission of motivating people to know God, to love God, to love thy neighbor, and to preach the gospel. To support this, he changed the Catholic Church's attitude to have far more warm and friendly relationships with our sister and brother Christians, with fellow believers in God, and with all people who are well. He made the Catholic Church more open and to new ways of thinking. If some rules were distractions or getting in the way of the church's mission, or were just not correct, then he changed those rules. But his focus was on the mission of the organization, and that was steadfast and unwavering. While change management and organizational behavior were far from his areas of expertise, and he probably wouldn't even recognize either of those terms if God sent him down to us today, uh, we can learn from him on how to empower the many people in one's organization to collectively make progress and overcome organizational inertia and the opposition of a few. I hope that I've always kept in mind in my work that having prosperity and being in a leadership position is moral capital. This moral capital is need to be used for a purpose, that one uses one to influence for the well-being of many, the customers and users of your product, the associates of the company, the shareholders of the company, one's community, and to some extent society as a whole. Success is never earned by one person alone, that comes with the support of one's associates in the organization. Everyone correctly asked, do you as a leader create the environment that enables the people in the organization to excel operationally? This is crucially important to success. But also, leadership needs to be concerned with, do you create an environment and set appropriate goals in your organization that make it easier or harder for your people to achieve their objectives without feeling the need to cut corners? Do you make it easier or harder for them to succeed together on a win-win basis with their fellows? Or are there too many internal win-lose situations? Do you make it easier or harder for your people to fulfill their essential personal and family responsibilities? Do your people know that honor, moral principles, and obligations are more important than the bottom line. It is perhaps one of the greatest violations of a leader to go contrary to the words of the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation. I hope I fulfilled that. My greatest satisfaction in this work was seeing our people, not just a few, but many, really accomplish something significant, often in overcoming adversity. Of the multitude of good examples, I have time to just mention three. The people of MSA Brazil, 
in their early days in the 1970s, they lost over a million dollars, which is equivalent to five million today, partially due to a devastating fire. But in the ensuing years, they greatly recovered. In the last decade of the career of the manager whom I promoted, our earnings in Brazil were more every year on average than the total losses of the year. And they have gotten even better there as well as winning two World Cups for their and my favorite soccer team. <laughs> Secondly, MSA Murraysville, our major factory near Pittsburgh. At times of serious adversity after loss of a large government contract, we had to close one plant, and Murraysville had major performance problems. But we gave the Murraysville people in our hometown one last chance to save their factory. Work practices and quality had to be improved. And more importantly, we needed to have creative ideas from all of our people to make these results better, because they had to get there. Thereafter, not only did the Murraysville factory improve enough to keep operating, but afterwards, our people kept right on improving to the point where five years later, it was named by Industry Week as one of America's factories of the year. Third, I'm proud of our company's performance on 9-11. That day I was in Arequipa, of Peru, and all but three of our officers were out of town. Yet the organization knew what they had to do. Three trucks filled with safety equipment were on their way to disaster sites by 4.30. And one quarter of our sales force worked on the site for a couple months providing health and advice. When our MSA sales men on the fire department in Norfolk County, who lost several friends in the tragedy, was on the site continuously for weeks, sleeping in a crash pad for water pressure workers. Decades ago, there was an utterly forgettable movie, which I never saw and I hope you have it, that had a song that became a dreaded recorded music cliche. Yet it did have a catchy phrase. What's it all about? What's it all about when you sort it out, Alfie? So at that point in my life and now, I consider this question. What was it all about? It was about experiences like MSA Brazil, Murraysville, and 9-11. It was not about me, it was about team. Traditionally, there's a photo of the CEO on the letter to the shareholders page in every company's annual report, except for the first one which I shared with the Brandenburg Gate in the newly reunited room. None of the photos on that page during my tenure in the annual report was just of me. It was always me and some other LSA people. It was not about oversized compensation packages. I admit to being well paid, though I tried to stay below the compensation consultants midpoint but there is in our local newspaper an annual list called the Fortunate 50, which lists the 50 highest paid executives in the Pittsburgh area. Despite being CEO of one of the largest companies in town, I'm proud to have ducked off of this list every year or two. It's not about conspicuous consumption. My wife Catherine and I still live in our first home. I buy new clothes when Catherine tells me the old ones are worn out. I got a new company car only when the old one wasn't performing or when it cost too much to maintain. My last company car, a seven-year-old Volkswagen, was getting worn, but it survived until its cooling system conked out when I arrived at the office four days before my post-retirement personal car arrived. I was so proud how I got that absolute last doggone mile out of my last company car. I don't pretend to live austerely like a monk. Fortunately, God never asked me to do so. However, I do try to contribute generously to good causes, and my only luxuries are my home at Cape Cod, my wine collection, and travel. It's not about the size of the company. I always wanted our sales to grow because it makes the company healthy. Sales growth in your core businesses is the most direct way to make good earnings and shows that we're making what customers want. But our acquisitions are those which improve MSA and make money for our shareholders. 
Every business must take risks. But like in drinking wine, it should only be done in moderation. Big risks if they fail could hurt a lot of MSA people, even if not me. Much is said about economies of scale, and it is undoubtedly relevant in some industries that some not. However, I have seen a lot of instances of diseconomies of scale, where a company is too big to be managed efficiently. Leaders may not know well some elements of their business and their key people. Even though MSA is over a billion dollars in sales, I, in past years, and my successor now, can really personally know all the significant aspects of our business and all of our key people. Even now, after being retired for five years, I recognize all but one of the 31 people on our bonus list, and more than half of the 170 people in the highest evaluated positions worldwide. To us, people and elements of our business are real entities, not names on a list and numbers. Regarding competitors, I am much more wary of the clever and the quick than the large and the strong. All of those were what it was not about, Alfie, and what was it about? It's primarily about our noble mission, that men and women may work in safety, and they, their families, and their communities they live in hell throughout the world. It was about doing things that are important for our customers extraordinarily well. Financial success does not come from directly chasing the buck, but in focusing on key tasks and fulfilling them in a greatly effective manner. Organizations that do this, that do many important things well, wake up someday and find out that they're financially successful. It was about our people and their success and well-being. It was about team. It was about MSA being that city on the hill, mentioned in the Bible and Ronald Reagan speeches, being an example of what a good company can be for others to learn, admire, and emulate. It was about trying to help where I could, supporting good ideas and dedicated people. It was about assisting our customers in our common task of protecting people in harm's way in every corner of the world. It was about using one's moral capital for the good, as in the gospel story of the talents, read at my father's funeral. About being that servant, given five talents and earning five more. It was about the company performing very well in difficult, competitive environments, because that's what we're supposed to do because good performance allows us in management to stay in place and run the company the way it should be run. It was at times also about our being challenging and demanding in this competitive world because that's what it takes to win. Like what we saw in Chuck Noll, Coach Tommy Dungy, and the late Penguins Coach Bob Johnson. All really nice guys who challenged their team to win champions. But it was also about thinking and caring about the long-term interests of our associates. Because the company needs everyone on the team working together with enthusiasm to pursue our common goal of fulfilling our mission. Not every decision I made might have been popular. But I can assure you that in every significant decision, the interests of our associates were thought about and cared about. Sometimes it was deciding factors, sometimes not. When we made painful decisions, it was in situations where, in the long term, the alternatives would have been worse for our people as a whole. Some executives, such as Chainsaw Al and Neutron Jack, might be successful in squeezing the employees as a whole in order to make the short-term buck, like many of those in the private equity business in these days is frightfully described in the business press. However, I don't know how to run a business that way, and I don't want to learn. It was about keeping in mind the phrase I think I originated with. If trying your best to fulfill God's work on earth was a serious felony, there would be undoubtedly enough evidence to indict you. But would there be enough to get a conviction? <laughs> it was about what MSA people told me. I appreciated the comment of an anonymous colleague who said of my manager. He gave us a map, a destination, a really wide area where we could travel. 
and he gave us the keys to the car as we and to drive this and we saw fit. Of course, if they had an accident or got the car stuck, I'd have a serious challenge. A retiring mill manager at my first management meeting, goodness, 40 years ago, he said, quote, what I like most about this company is that you never have to do anything that you know is wrong in order to help yourself or help the company. Over 40 years ago, he expressed the essence of a successful business ethics program. We have long, have long had a strong formal ethics program. Once our auditors described us as the anti enterprise and recently another consultant on the new Foreign Corrupt Practices Act law said, quote, you have an extremely strong culture on ethics, among the strongest I've seen in my work. He really liked that when he asked, his team asked individual MSA people, who owns the ethics program at MSA? Without hesitation, most of the associates replied, I do, meaning they individually are responsible. Another fellow on his retirement summarized what many people have told me and my predecessors over the years. Thank you very much. I got my first job here. I got a chance to get my degree at night school because MSA supported me. I saved enough from what I earned here to get married. I educated our children and paid off the mortgage with what I made here. And now I retire with a good pension and an area of interest that I picked up during my time here. I, of course, responded, thank you very much for all you've contributed to building up MSA to be a great company. But the words he said have always stuck with me. It's one of the most set, more satisfying parts of what I did in business. And then a dying friend told his colleague to thank those of us in the company who tried our best to try to help him in his time of need. Hearing these messages was perhaps more meaningful than anything to me. In addition to doing what is right, what in the end matters to me most is respect. This is more value than money, more value than fame, and the most important kind of respect is from those who know you the best and the longest. And this, for me, now and always, was what it really was all about. And so I'll conclude with a few famous, favorite quotations of famous people by Woodrow Wilson, President of the United States in the year MSA was founded. You are not here merely to make a living. You are here in order to enable the world to live more amply and with greater vision, with the finest spirit of honor and achievement. You are here to enrich the world, and you impoverish yourself if you forget that error. And another by George Bernard Shaw, whom I'm not otherwise very fond of. There is the true joy in life of being used up for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one. I rejoice in life for its own sake. Life is no brief candle for me. It is a sort of splendid torch, which I have hold of for a moment, and that I want to make burn as brightly as possible before handing it over to future generations. And finally, by Reinhold Niebuhr, who was a famous theologian in the 20th century, and to whom, among others, the serenity prayer this different quotation reads, nothing worth doing is completed in a lifetime. Therefore, we must be saved by hope. Nothing true and beautiful and good makes complete sense in any immediate context of history. Therefore, we must be saved by faith. Nothing we do, however virtuous, can be accomplished alone. Therefore, we must be saved by love. So I went forth that day thanking each one of my fellow MSA associates and their predecessors for their support in our adventure together. Because whatever we accomplished could only have been done by all of us working jointly. And so thank you very much for listening to me. Those are my thoughts. I enjoyed Q&A, so uh, to have a volunteer or two here and get the discussion flowing. Thanks again for the talk, that was really great. Um, 
I guess I can speak for myself. Uh, that's what they said my name. <laughs> Perfect, sorry. Um, I guess I can speak for everyone here when I say that uh, growing up at one point or another, I saw business as something where you couldn't be good and you couldn't be successful. Gordon Gecko is a very popular uh, yeah. iconic image of that. Um, but it's something that we, we really stress here, especially at the MSBA program, is that the practical and in terms of, of morals, as well as the practical business, more often than not, unite. And I, want, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about that and your experiences with that. Uh, your, your last part of the question, could you say again? Sure, that we, we, we really stress and believe, um, and in a lot of case studies see, that the moral, the good, the right thing to do, more often than not, if not always, lines up with what you should do sure. practically in the business. And if you could talk about your experiences with that. And that's, that's true. Life is hard. Life is complex. Life is sometimes not easy. But the first thing is, is to do things proper and ethically is the only way to live. You, you don't want to live some other way. And if your job requires that you do something different, you need to quit and get another job. But also, I think in, in recent years, we have seen that companies that have violated ethical principles, that have cut corners, you know, they end up getting in trouble, and they also end up not being that successful. Uh, that uh, now, it takes skills, uh, skill to you know, to, to, get, to get to success. But cutting corners to get to success is not gonna get you success in the end. You're in the end gonna get frustrated. You might get away with it for a while. But when you, uh, and, and sometimes it's ethical and sometimes it's just stupidity. But I mean, the infamous quote of recent years, of, I think it was Chuck Prince of Citicorp, uh, trying to explain away all those bad loans that nearly brought our economy to its knees, that it's saying as long as the band is still playing, we have to dance. You know, where's the leadership there? Where's the sense that uh, uh, this is not going to be effective? <laughs> and, and uh, you know, we, you, you, uh, there's a cliche of, of a kid telling his or her parent that, well, everybody else is doing it, so I should be able to do it because everybody else is doing it. And we've all had our discussions like that. Uh, but everybody else is doing it. It's not a good reason to do it. So it's, uh, but you have to pick and choose the place you work. Because some companies can get away with this for a while, and sometimes for a longer time. Now, actually violating the law, there's fewer and fewer companies you know, doing that. And uh, because they're realizing that it's stupid. But uh, to, uh, to hurt our society uh, by the way we run our organizations is, uh, it's unfortunate sometimes that can, can be successful for a while. And it's frustrating to see it. But all we can do is uh, run our little part of the world the best we can and hope that some people notice. First of all, and then depending what part of the organization you're in, is focusing on what work really needs to be done 
And, and what doesn't need to be done? What's nice to, to, to try, but not, cru not crucially needed? Then I uh, uh, handle my uh, the, the, uh, uh, work demands often by when I work late and on the weekends, it was always calm. You know, with technology today, you can do that. And uh, you can, so then you're there, and you can you go for a bit, and then you break off, and and, and if, if you need it in some areas, you can uh, you can do that. Uh, I think of an example. You know, people. There's long been a discussion: should companies uh, give guidance on earnings? And some companies do, and some don't. Uh, we never have, and the world's coming more to that opinion. But when we were, uh, when not too many people were that way, I thought to myself, how much energy would it take for us to really estimate what our earnings are this quarter? In addition, I mean, I think it's better for us to spend that energy trying to take care of our customers and trying to do things more productively and do something that really will be value added. But you, you. If we made guidance, we'd spend have a lot of people spend a lot of time doing it, and I don't think there's there's value to the shareholders or to anybody else doing it. And then what happens is then then we get so focused on making the numbers rather than than serving our customers and, and doing it. Uh, you need to look at organizations and jobs and what their attitudes are. Now you know. A single person who's very young and, and really motivated to you know be the next great startup, you know maybe that's all they'll do. I think it's a mistake. But some people, it's I say absolutely, it's not worth sacrificing your family, your family life, like by not having a family, by not having children, or by messing up the family that you have. You know, then you've really got to step away from. Uh, but it's it's a challenge, uh, and uh, it, it's it's you know, er, it's judgment every day. But I also did, did try, as with this one fellow, to try as a leader to help people out at something like that. And while I worked, you know, say worked at home a lot, you know, you could have some Pavarotti on, and when you had lunch, you can have have some nice wine. And, in moderation and, and uh, everything like that, and then and, and then uh, uh, go back to work. I I am proud that in my 39 years with the company, I took every single day of vacation that I was authorized. <laughs> every single one. I never missed one in 39 years. Uh, and and I know that my you know my father set that tone, and people knew he took all his vacation too. It makes people more energized when they come back. And, and, uh, uh, and life, the, I mean, I, I go on to say that if we as business organizations just demand everybody works all the time, you know, where are we going to get, where are we going to get children for the next generation? And where are we going to get children who will be properly raised and, and uh, as such? I mean, are we eating our seed corn? But it's, you know, life is tough, and, 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 and some people have more tolerance for this than other things, and, uh, and, and couples need to work out what's, what's fair for, for each of them. And, uh, but, you know, don't mess your family up. It's too important. There's nothing more important that you do in life. know that, uh, that one of the main reasons we organize events like this is to give you real life examples of people who, who care about being honorable and moral and are successful in business so that you know that it is possible. And, and I wish for all of you the blessing of, of when you leave here to work in a company that is run in the same spirit as John Ryan ran his company and even more that you, you someday all of you will run a company in that spirit as well.
I want to invite you now to remain those of you who can, who don't have to rush off to your next class. Uh, we have some refreshments, and we'll remain for another uh, 20 minutes or so if you want to ask any questions. Uh, personally to Mr. Ryan, he's, he's up here in the front. Uh, so please stay and, and mingle until you, until you have to leave. Thank you all for joining us.